I'm Russ Kickle and on this episode of American Reef, we're going to talk about the lessons that I learned when my 110 gallon tank tank split a seam, gallons of water were gushing out the side, right? And what I did to basically triage that, save the inhabitants, right? And kind of build this structure all within a 24 to 36 hour window because I was heading out of town and unfortunately the trip could not be canceled and, and as such, those were that kind of cards that I was dealt. So again, all that and more on this episode of American Reef. So in this video, what we're going to do is basically break it up into three parts. The first part is the issue, the tank seam kind of what I did when I noticed it. Second, the temporary home that I built for the inhabitants. And then lastly, the final home, right? What I chose, why I chose it, things of that nature. And let's preface this by saying when my tank first leaked, Basically, it happened on a Thursday afternoon, we'll say around two or three o'clock, and we were scheduled to be going out of town Friday at four o'clock. And the out of town trip could not be canceled. So for my end of it, there was a lot that I had to do in a relatively short time with very little planning. So let's talk about what happened first. Basically around two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, my wife sends me a text message and says, you have a leak in your tank. And I'm thinking, well, there's something light going on, right? Then I start getting alerts on my phone because I have the Neptune Apex set up with the leak detection system. And when I start getting these alerts, I knew that it would be significant at least. So when I come look at this tank, basically the right seam on that side was gushing water out. I'm talking gallons per minute. Uh, I want to say probably 10-ish gallons per minute, maybe 20. It's hard for me to gauge it because, you know, at the time, you know, things were kind of just, holy crap, I didn't know this was going to happen or didn't expect it to happen. That being said, you know, the first thing that I did when I saw all that water, it was actually shooting over onto my UPS system, right? Now, to me, I thought, hey, I have a GFCI, I should be in good shape, but the power was still running. So I couldn't figure out why the GFCI didn't kick, right? First thing I do, round down to the, uh, the circuit box, right? Hit the circuit breaker, and from there, I figure my, no worries, right? So I come back up, and I get a bucket, and what I proceed to do at that time is to basically catch the water that was spewing out and putting it back in the tank, giving me time to think and devise a plan. Well, as I was doing this, the one thing that I realized was that UPS had a battery in it and it was still doing its thing, meaning, you know, water was there, it started to smoke a little bit and I'm like, wow, how stupid is that, right? So again, what I did at that point in time, disconnected it, threw that thing outside, figuring I'll figure out what's going on there. But you know, you have a battery in there, you have salt water, that bad things can happen then, right? So first lesson, on that UPS, right, or any kind of battery backup that you've got, there's two kind of, you know, tips or words of caution. Number one, for me, try to put it in the location far enough away that you know it won't get wet. To me, nature finds a way, so to speak, so it will always get wet some way, shape, or form. So the second thing would be make sure whatever kind of battery backup you do get is waterproof, right? Um, because I know I'll see a lot of the, uh, the Ecotech kind of battery backups mounted on walls and doors, etc. And though they are off the ground, water can still get at them. So you'd have to, you know, kind of devise some way to make sure they're waterproof or maybe it is waterproof. I'm, I'm not even sure, but it's a consideration, right? Just think about that when, you know, you have one on your tank. And um, again, it's, uh, it's, it's a possibility that it can get wet, 
right? So know that going into it and plan accordingly. In my particular case, like I said, I had it. It was far in front of this tank. I did not expect it to, uh, to get any water, but the angle which it kind of shot out was such that it got wet. Um, so again, fire hazard, health hazard, some bad stuff could have happened there. Luckily we were home, able to catch it, and um, it wasn't an issue. But that being said, lesson number one. So while I, I had that issue contained, I'm dumping the water back into the tank thinking, okay, what am I gonna do? Because my goal at this point is to kind of save the, the, the lives of as many organisms as I possibly can. Um, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to save them all, but you know, you kind of, pick which ones you really want and from there that's what you know you kind of devise your plan around so for me um, you know what I really wanted to do was make sure that I salvaged all of the fish right and all of the corals and if I any coral had to go for example um, I had a huge Monty over on this left side um, I figured hey I could let that go because on the right side I had the purple and orange Monty's that Again, I, they were redundant, so I could always grow them back again. So in my mind, you know, I wanted to come up with a plan that would basically, you know, store or house those organisms. I had two tanks that I had not set up yet. One of them was a 90-gallon tank, right, and another one was basically a 30-gallon. One was I was going to set up for fresh water and keep the other one for backup or vice versa. Uh, Long story made short, I used the 90 gallon breeder and I brought it up and my goal was to get as much of this water out of here into that tank. The problem was is by the time I kind of figured everything out, there may have been 50 gallons here so I knew it was going to be shallow and I didn't want to shock anything per se. So again, from my end of it, what I did is I kind of raised the tank up on one end to allow water to go in so that I could at least get things covered in water as I put them in. And then from there, kind of add water gradually so as not to shock the organisms, but at the same time to bring that water level higher. So that was my plan, right? I brought the tank up, again, siphoned the water out of here into there and you know, you've all seen that done before, but basically you start to gradually migrate things over when the water level permits, right? Um, after I got at least most of the organisms over there, again, I realized that that Monty on this left-hand side wasn't going to make it, so I didn't even worry about him because he was too deep, right? I just knew it wouldn't fit. Um, and luckily enough, though, everything else kind of smashed down enough where I got everything at least wet, and then it allowed me time to figure out what I was going to do. So I did that, and once I did that, basically, you know, water at this tank stopped actually leaking at one point. And so, I mean, I had puddles of water. I mean, it was, you know, again, 50 gallons of water, 60, whatever amount of water um, on the floor, and it's a hardwood floor, so it was just, it was a mess, right? That being said, I just had one goal, keep these things alive. Knowing that, again, I am got to be out of town here in a 24-hour kind of window, so what am I going to do, right? So the first thing I'm thinking of is once I had everything in my temporary container, which luckily I had, right, and, you know, again, that's kind of that second lesson, make sure that you have some sort of container that you can dump the, basically, organisms in, and with that container, make sure it's large enough. Right? For me, I ran out of space. Right. So if I could have had something bigger, that would have been better. But the problem is too, when you're by yourself, you can't necessarily bring or hold, you know, these big bins like the glass tank, for example, a 90 gallon glass breeder. It was pretty heavy for me to kind of get in here by myself. I didn't have a dolly or anything like that, which is again, another lesson learned. Um, you know, I got it in here, but it, it took some doing to do that. Right. So when you are planning, make sure your container is large enough and you can move it, right? And as we said on previous episodes, we always want to have kind of a reserve with extra water in it that basically we can use in this particular kind of case to, you know, either do your water changes or in, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the case of, you know, a disaster that you've got this water that the fish can go into. And that kind of helped me out. But again, just lessons learned that, you know, though I knew I had a container, I didn't realize how heavy that thing was going to be, right, to actually move it. And 
the consideration, whether that's dollies or whatever you have in mind, right? Just make sure you have that as one of the considerations in your kind of disaster recovery plan. So with that being said, um, what my first goal was to set up that temporary environment with a life support kind of system that would keep it going for one slash maybe 10 days, right? I didn't know how much time I needed, um, but that was my goal. Well, luckily, if you remember me with the Tunzi, the hang on skimmers, right? The 90 um, I, I believe they're the 90 um, With those skimmers, um, you know, they were hang on the back type. So I could easily remove them from the sump and put them into this 90 gallon breeder. Again, the nice part about that is I had three of them in the sump because I was experimenting more with wet skimming, dry skimming, and how the hang on backs actually work compared to the just individual in sumps. And I really liked the idea of having the, the three um, you know, skimmers in that sump. Um, and luckily in this particular case, they allowed me the extra kind of, uh, we'll say value add of being able to use them in my temporary system. So what I did is I basically set up on each corner um, one of those skimmers. So I was basically throwing oxygen and aerating the water while at the same time skimming it and providing the normal filtration that this tank normally had in it, or its predecessor, I should say. So I knew that's how I was going to um, make sure that I had enough kind of skimming and aeration going on, but I also wanted that circulation. Luckily, I just pulled the, the, the power heads out of my 110, dropped it into the temporary, so now I had circulation going. And then the last thing that I want to do as it basically um, related to kind of the water quality is I wanted to make sure that I had some kind of ROX slash carbon media for, uh, for the filtration. Again, you know, I had two freshwater kind of hang on filters that I had actually never used, but I knew in back of my mind I would use them for a disaster recovery kind of process. And that's what I did here. So what I did is I put a hang on overflow filter on and all I did is I put, you know, bulk of supply ROX in it. Again, why? Just the normal. To me, more filtration can't hurt, especially when I moved that tank, I didn't know if there was anything weird in the water or in the containers that I used, right? While I was, you know, um, uh, temporarily kind of holding things or I just didn't know. So to me, carbon's a good thing. Um, so I threw that carbon in there and I knew that water quality wise, I'd be okay. And then the next thing I wanted to do was make sure that I had lighting on this system. So from a lighting perspective, I really fell short, meaning I had no backup plans there whatsoever. Meaning in my mind, if I ever had a real d disaster, what I was going to do is I was going to take the metal halide light um, that I actually used uh, previous to these AIs and I was just going to put that, turn that on, put the ballast on and use it. Well, again, I hadn't used that thing for many, many years, right? Uh, couldn't find ballasts. Um, it was just a failure from that pers perspective. So I said, fine, I'll take and move this over on top of that holding tank. Basically, I devised a generic system where since these had rails on it, um, I basically set two chairs up, put the rails on it, and let this thing set on those rails. And then from that point in time, I had the exact same lighting as they had in this tank. So in general, that kind of, we'll say temporary system, was set up such that I knew that um, you know it could support the life that I had, and I may have to worry about things jumping out, etc. Um, but for the most part, you know, it was in good shape. Um, one thing that I also did that I forgot to mention is the heaters. Right, I wanted to make sure again from a heating perspective that at least that water was at the right temperature. Um, you know, the good news about that is I had the heaters. The, the, the bad news is they were smaller heaters. Um, so, you know, the, the range basically um, was such that I couldn't heat the water up as high as I would have liked it, you know, to the, the 78 degrees. Um, but I was able to keep it in the, again, in the mid 70s. So those smaller uh, units actually worked out okay. And one of the good things that I did like about that is as I knew if they would stick, because heaters do stick, that since they were smaller, it wasn't gonna basically boil the water. Right. So, you know, to that point, I had water that was, again, heated, 
filter, filtered correctly, had enough circulation in there to make sure to blow bad things off the corals and basically keep them in suspension till they hit the, the overflow or the, excuse me, the skimmers so I could get them out of there. All right, so at that point in time, you know, I think probably we'll say four hours had passed and life was not too bad. Meaning for me, I thought if I wasn't home, this whole system would have been shot, right? I would have lost everything and maybe even the house burned down because of the UPS versus kind of the, the GFCI, right? Because even though I had the GFCI, again, it did not work. Um, and that being said, you know, I, 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 I had time at that point to kind of sit back and think, okay, what, you know, what do I want to do here? Do I want to basically build a system and, um, you know, from that point, kind of do it all in a day, right? Um, or do I want to take my time and do it the right way? Well, I didn't do it the right way, right? I was kind of like, no, no, you know, let me see if somebody at my local fish store kind of has a tank and then that will make my decision for me. If they have a tank, I'm just going to try to, you know, again, slam it out. So this is where the second or not, this is where another lesson, right, comes to play, meaning, um, you know, you've heard me say support your local fish stores, right, uh, as well as kind of small mom and pop businesses just because they have a heart and a soul. In this particular case, you know, I called my local fish store, which this one happened to be Elmer's Aquariums in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, right? Um, and I called and said, hey, do you have a tank larger than like 90 gallons, for example? And they had two or three. Great, right? Because again, if I would have called somebody else, like a Petco's or any of those national chains, most likely they wouldn't have had that, right? Um, so one reason to support that local fish store but then the other reasons when i get there right um again they stayed open for me they knew i was coming um you know even though it was closing time kind of thing but uh again they give you that kind of love there and then you know when i went down to actually see the tanks i had two options i could go with this 125 or 180. the 125 wasn't kind of reef ready the 180 was um you know but to me, with those options, though I would not have chosen either one of these tanks, I had an option to go with, right? And it was a, a fairly good option, like I said. Though I wouldn't have chosen them, you know, it's one of those things where I can definitely make do with them. So uh, with that being said, I chose this 125 because it actually fit better on the wall, right? And in the room, the other one's just a little bit too big. Uh, that being said though, um, one of the other things is how do you get a larger tank basically back to your home, right? What do you do with the tank that has the leak in it, right? The sump and the sand and all that sort of stuff, right? And again, with that local fish store, they had a service that did that. Not only did they do that, you know, I, they were nice enough to bring this tank out the following morning, right? So it was probably eight or 8.30 when we were at that fish store. And they said, yeah, first delivery in the morning will be you, right? And what they ended up doing is basically taking that old tank, the old stand and the old sump, out, right? And they replaced it with this one. So that those services that you have in your local fish stores, right, are services that you can't get everywhere. And I can't stress enough that, you know, one of the reasons why we have to support those local fish stores, right, and 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 not on, not always shop based on price, right, is because you know those fish stores will be there. Right. If you give them a reason to be there, m meaning, you know, it's profitable for them to stay in business. Right. But they'll be there when you have a problem and you need them. Right. And, and it's something you won't get from, again, larger kind of uh, stores just because they're not designed that way. It's not how they work. So that being said, I can't say enough about Elmer's Aquarium. They had a great staff, again, professional and just did everything, you know, been out of the they bent over backwards to try to help me out to make sure that basically, you know, I didn't get screwed here. And uh, with that being said, you know, from my end of it, it was morning time, you know, and they got that tank in and out. And I was sitting there saying, hey, this is going to be okay. I'm going to be able to build this tank out and still be able to go on my trip, right? Again, big mistake. That being said, let's take a break and we'll continue and talk about that.
moving back to the tank. So I knew I had a tank and I thought that I'd be able to basically, you know, get it set up before I had to get out of town, even though getting out of town now was measured in hours, right? Less than 10 hours or so. Um, and again, the lesson learned there is I should have taken my time, but we'll get into that. So at this point, I have a tank. It, it's the 125. It is not reef ready. Um, so my, my choice is now from an overflow perspective, do I want to drill the glass, right? Or do I want to use the, use the CPR overflows? Because I have a drill, right? I have the whole saw. I have the overflow boxes. Um, and for me, it was kind of like, why would I choose one over another? And I know the, the overflow boxes, and in my case, it's a CPR over, overflow box. They get a bad reputation or, you know, you'll hear a lot of talk about people don't like them. For me, it's the opposite. I, th I think that they are very useful and very practical, right? And as far as kind of points of failure, people are worrying about, you know, if they fail, right? Your tank will basically overflow to the top. And to me, things like that are easily managed by testing out and, and controlling the water volume in your tank so that when, if you lose power or the overflow doesn't work correctly, right? Basically that you have enough excess capacity in the tank to hold that water that would get pumped up. That being said, um, you know, to me, when I kind of mentally chose, you know, which I was going to go with, there were pros and cons to each. Like the seals have gone bad on, you know, overflows that are, we'll call it traditional overflows in the tank, which have caused leaks. Um, you know, on the kind of overflows that are hang on overflows, uh, power goes out, they lose their siphon, things of that, that nature. So to me, those all kind of were all in the same boat, meaning um, they kind of, they, they basically um, washed each other out because there were, there were cons on both sides. But for me, the, the pro that decided me to put the CPRs back on was the same reason why I chose them to begin with, meaning that if I scratch the front of this glass up with my magnet, right, I can always take, drain the water out, flip the tank around, and then I've got a brand new clean piece of glass here that I don't have to worry about, you know, as far as being damaged. And if I drill or put holes in glass, you can't necessarily turn them over or patch them and look aesthetically correct. You know, so to me, that one pro was the reason why I decided to keep the CPR overflows. Now, I did decide to change that up. I used to have two, and what I did is I decided, you know, I don't necessarily need to, right? Uh, when I first built the last tank, I was kind of like, I had one for backup, or for me now, I'm kind of like, I don't really care. I'll be notified when like water drops or something like that in my sump. Um, so, you know, if it fails, then I'll have a little more, again, tank, you know, water or water volume, but nothing bad is going to happen. So I'm going to just stick with one. But again, the lesson learned there was when I pulled the CPR overflows off, I never ever did any husbandry on these CPR overflows, right? I mean, they just sucked water down and it worked. But when you look at it and all the tunneling worms and all the marine life that built up and created this cocoon effect, right, of tunnels inside there, um, it was, it was amazing that any water could actually get through there. So I couldn't pick a CPR up locally. Um, again, a lot of local fish stores don't carry them. Um, so I was kind of like, well, I'll just clean out the ones that I have. And it took some doing. It probably took an hour or so to basically break down that material and flush a lot of it away. Um, but in the end, I was able to kind of clean them out. And, you know, for the most part, um, they work as if they are brand new. And again, I use the CPR overflows on here. Uh, they are a decade old, right? Maybe even longer, right? I think I started the original Tang Tank and using them back in 2007, right? And we're into, you know, 2018 now. So uh, again, that's acrylic and they may get a bad rap, but I have only good things say, to say about Ross and company over at CPR. So with that being said, again, what I decided to do is go with the CPR overflow, then I was thinking, okay, from a sump level, what do I want to do there? Do I want to do anything different? 
And ultimately, my goal is I want to simplify things as much as possible. So two things that I did actually to kind of simplify um, the, we'll say, the traditional kind of setup that I had versus the setup I have now. So um, when I was designing the sump, or at least thinking about the sump, I was like, do I want to continue with my external pump? And originally I used my external pump because I wanted to have, again, basically uh, less heat inside the water. So you had a motor outside that would basically turn around, you know, we'll say the, the um, I don't even know what, what it's called, but basically the cylinder that causes the water to return up to the top, but that since the motor is on the outside of the sump, it doesn't allow any heat to go into the water. And I thought that was a value there. Um, but with the new efficiencies and the Eheim pumps, et cetera, I was like, you know, I'm gonna go with an in-sump pump. Right? Again, I chose e Eheim because I had an Eheim here. Um, again, it had enough flow rate going through the tank because again, I was going to use that as a backup if the other pump ever went bad. So again, having that backup allowed me to at least know that which pump I was going to use. With that pump, I also had the, uh, the tubing that would basically feed my um, uh, sea swirl right? Because that's basically the return line in there. And so, again, I had all that stuff ready and available, so I was good there. Uh, I thought about from a sump perspective, and I had some larger tanks that I, did, that I had around, and I decided to rather than use a tank and, and divide it, to go with a smaller sump, right, that basically ecosystems had, right, for the Miracle Mud, because I, I still wanted to use Miracle Mud, and I liked the way that they had the three chamber kind of effects set up, and just the general construction of the sump, right, and again, I had that sump here before from one of my other projects, um, so basically I used that ecosystem sump with Miracle Mud, because again, I like that, but what I, what I didn't take into consideration with this sump is it has lips over to the top for bracing, and those lips actually prevent those hang on the back kind of skimmers from actually working. So ultimately what I end up doing was replacing the 39004 skimmers with the one Tunzi 9410 skimmer. And one of the reasons why I chose that Tunzi 9410 skimmer, besides the fact that it produced this great skim mate, was it had three features that I really liked. One was an anti-foaming feature, which basically prevents the foam from coming out of the cup when, for example, the return pump is shut off and water fills that sump up, but the skimmer keeps running. Right? The second feature is it's super quiet, and the way that the air chamber is actually designed, it pulls the wet or moist air out of the collection cup, which in turn basically allows this skimmer not to have to be cleaned as frequently as, we'll say, a traditional skimmer like, again, like the Vertex or like the uh, Reef Octopus. And then lastly, it's got this media bag in here. And remember, my goal is to try to simplify a little bit. So I'm going to try to eliminate my GFO reactor. So what I'm going to do is put my GFO in this bag and just see how in general it works. So in the end, in order to get that 9410 to fit in that sump, what I did was basically put down four biospheres and then laid some egg crate on top of it which basically the second chamber now held the, um, the skimmer and the first chamber would hold my macroalgae. So, you know, let's talk about the macroalgaes for a bit. Um, I had the macroalgaes in a bucket while all this was taking place. I didn't worry about heating it up or giving it circulation or anything like that. And ultimately, with it not being used to, to the direct light, the water change, etc., a lot of it, you know, started to die off. Um, when I put it in here. So again, lesson to learn there, just throw that little, you know, light above it and, you know, throw a heater in it and it probably would have been just fine. Um, but in my case, I didn't do that. And so when I did put it in there, it was kind of, again, I'll say it was starting to, to die. Uh, but I figured again, if enough of it lived, it would take care of itself. And actually it has. Um, that being said though, the other thing is Tunzi has that LED light that I used on the previous sump to kind of light it up. It's waterproof, um, it has the full spectrum on it, and I find it just the perfect sump light. So I use that, that LED light as the sump light in my macro algae uh, chamber. And so when you look at how this unit is set up, basically 
you know, as I was designing it, the simplified way is I took the external pump, made it internal, right? So one thing there, right? And, um, and it still kind of follows that same general flow where you have, you know, a dumping chamber where you have the macroalgae, then from there it goes over miracle mud, and then from there I have the, uh, basically the skimmer, and then it goes back through some bio balls, and then out to basically um, the main display tank. And for me, I don't have as much bio media in here. I use those ceramic balls from the, uh, from the last tank because it already had all the colonized bacteria in it. Um, but for me, there just wasn't enough room in this little sump for basically, you know, to bring over the big blocks that I had and all the rest of the bio balls. And after I thought about kind of uh, what was set up and the, you know, the additional kind of layout that I had, I figured ultimately things would kind of balance themselves off a little because as I was designing this, I thought, I'm not going to go with uh, a sand bed on this one. Um, you know, the idea of the sand bed, I still love. Uh, again, holds tons of bacteria, etc. But for me, the sand would scratch the glass, you know, if it would get underneath the magnet. And I'm figuring with all the modern technologies, for example, that you see today, um, with the filtration, et cetera, and the reactors, I could, I could basically buy my way out of that. This way I can have a nice clean bottom. And, um, you know, if you've ever gone to uh, Worldwide Corals, for example, or Top Shelf Aquatics, um, those guys have uh, a lot of tanks where they have, again, just bare bottoms. And, you know, they'll have things growing on them that are just really add another dimension to the tank. So to me, that's what I decided. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use that floor as uh, another place to grow corals up through and attach onto. Different story down the road, but anyway, that, that was my thought process of not wanting sand in here. Um, and so with that though, I knew that there was a lot of filtration that was taking place in that sand and in those bio media. So I was going to try to keep an eye open just to say, how do things look, right? Are things kind of established? To, to get back to Mike's point uh, on his 90 gallon Elos tank, how nothing really survived until we put that really lush live rock in there with the sponges. Right? So that kind of biodiversity was something that, um, you know, I'm taking more of it out and uh, figured it could potentially be an issue. Um, the tank is been running now, I want to say probably two months. Um, and I haven't kind of ran into any of the issues yet. However, the tank still, the corals are growing, um, but they're not quite as colorful, we'll say, as the, they were in the existing tank. So maybe that's part of the issue. Not quite sure. We'll, you know, time will tell with that one. Um, so as far as the layout goes, right, the, the life support system, etc., that's what I was going to do, right, uh, from a filtration end of it. I decided also that I wanted to eliminate the uh, calcium reactor. Um, I like calcium reactors, etc., but I wanted to see if just the calc washer would be enough to supply the calcium alkalinity needs of this tank. Because again, there's not a ton of uh, SBS. It's kind of like that right side over there with the Montes and you know some of the other branch and corals. Um, and over here again, you got the LPS kind of stuff. So again, I don't think that there's a high demand in there. And so I wanted to do is see if again, just that you know Kalkwasser reactor would work for here. And again, so far it has. But that's what you know the other piece that I eliminated to try to simplify the tank and. Um, and, and from that end of it, once I kind of defined that, I knew that that was the filtration kind of system, right, that I wanted to put in place. Um, as far as circulation goes, um, again, you know that I'm a big fan of the Tunzi products. I just basically took the, uh, the Tunzi Stream, right, the, uh, not only the Tunzi Stream 3, which I tucked back behind this mountain of Euphelia, but um, all of the other streams that I did, and I just kind of moved them over to this tank. And what I did different, since it was bare bottom, I literally put them onto the bottom, right? And I pointed them so it's causing that sweeping effect uh, onto basically the floor of the tank. And for the most part, it's doing an excellent job. I've got uh, basically a sweeper in this corner, sweeper behind here, sweeper in that corner, and actually nothing down there. I have an Ecotech uh, actually just sitting over the other one that is going to left over from many moons ago. And, and it's funny because that's a, another one of those love-hate relationships there because with that Ecotech, it's the MP40. 
Uh, again, it's still running good, right? The problem is you have that whirling and the noises and all that sort of stuff. And I know they've upgraded and fixed the, uh, the pumps themselves, um, but I just haven't wanted to invest any more money in, in kind of that line of it. So um, most likely when that does go, I'll put another stream in there. Um, again, on that side of it, the reason why I chose the streams and why I didn't want to replace them was because literally I can take that magnet, mount it on, and I'm sweeping it straight across. Where if I would have went with the, the Ecotech, right, the MP whatevers, um, you'd still have to mount it on a side somewhere, right? Or otherwise it'd kind of be like a volcano. Um, and, and that's not, it's not the effect that I needed to basically, you know, sweep the bottom here. So, you know, from that end of it, I, Big fan of the Tunzies. Again, we know that they are a sponsor of American Reef. And uh, again, I can't be more happier with their products just because not only the value, but you know, the warranties that they give you, the support, et cetera. And uh, that's why I chose them on this one. And so when you look at it, I mean, there's a lot of Tunzi kind of products on here, um, but not, you know, it's a simple system for the most part, right? Meaning other than the circulation, right? Um, the only other thing that I have as far as kind of technology would be the lighting, right? And then um, the oscillators, which are the sea sweeps and the sea swirls, which do nothing that basically create an oscillating current in the tank to kind of break up any kind of linear um, streams that you do have. And that's what you see for my return up top. And then as far as just the circulating tonsy there. Um, so you have the lights and that. Um, and again, the idea for, for the, the environment, I was happy with what I had before, but I want to try to tweak it just a little more. That being said, as far as the lights, um, I do want to replace those, probably with the, the Radions. I'm not exactly sure at this point, um, but with these AIs, they've lasted a, a long, long time. Um, and for the most part, I am really happy with them. Um, and for this particular case, I haven't decided to, to, to basically take them out, but I will be doing that because ultimately I can see, especially now that there's not white sand, um, there is a difference in that spectrum of the other full spectrums, and these are not full spectrums. These are just the blues. Um, so that change will be coming down the, down the road, but for now, I didn't change them. They are the same lights that were actually over the uh, temporary tank, and to that end of it, the reason why I wanted to do that ultimately is I didn't want to put too much stress or shock on the corals because at the end of the day, these are the ones that I wanted to, to save. Now, speaking of which, what are those ones, right? When you look at it, basically we'll, we'll say three kind of main categories. The Montes, right? The Leather, and basically the Euphilia Hammer kind of corals, right? The LPS is over there. I don't have a ton of corals yet. As the tank matures, like I said, I'll start wor working on maybe some branching or maybe some LPS, uh, Lord, maybe Lord Akin, kind of, uh, you know, those kinds of corals. We'll say fleshy, but yet moving, right? Um, we'll see. But for now, just the exact same corals I had in the other tank because um, I didn't have any room in the other tank. They all kind of would grow and I would prune them and they would grow and I would prune them and, you know, that cycle. So as it relates to kind of the temporary system and what I decided to migrate into this system, that's what I decided to migrate into this system. And for the most part, like I said, uh, this tank has been up for a few months now and knock on wood, right? Um, I'm happy with everything so far. Um, you know, a, a couple lessons again that I've learned now that the tank has been up. Actually, let's take a commercial break and then let me come back to those lessons that I've learned. Again, some of the lessons that I learned now that the tank is up and running. Um, a bare bottom tank is really pretty when it's clean. It's kind of like a black car, right? It's beautiful when they're clean, but when they show the dirt and they're easily, you know, showing dirt, um, it's one of those things where 
becomes a pain, right? And in my particular case, you know, when I first put everything together, um, you know, one of the things that kind of jumped out at me was normally you have the algae that's glowing on the front of the glass that you have to take your magnets and clean them down with. Um, well, in this particular case, now that grows on the bottom. Um, you know, from, from, from the bottom, you also got the back, etc. And now there are more surface areas for that stuff to grow, which means more areas to clean. Um, and in cleaning some of these areas, it can be a little bit challenging, right? Because if you take your magnet, for example, and put it down on underneath and you clean it, number one, getting at everything with the braces tends to be a little bit challenging, right? But then the other thing is it gets back to the sand, right? Even though I didn't bring the sand in, there was sand on the rocks, right? Or even coral, little pieces of coral that fall off. And what, what happens is that will get underneath that magnet and it'll cause a scratch on the bottom. And though I can flip the tank around if it's a scratch on the side, I can't flip it around on the bottom. So number one, that was one kind of issue with a bare bottom tank that again, didn't just, I knew that there would be more maintenance, didn't realize, you know, again, kind of how much. Um, to try to minimize that, right, I found this really awesome product by Tunzi, right? I think it's called Care Bacter. Give me a second. Yes, Care Bacter, right? Again, it is basically a, um, a bacteria that its main function in life is to kind of eat that grunge, right? Um, and there's a lot more, and you'd have to go out and look at the Tunzi site. But one of its main, you know, kind of benefits is to reduce that algae that grows that you have to clean. And so when I realized, first of all, that I had the problem, I start looking for the products, right? And I, fall, and I, I found this, and then I, I didn't really know about it. And I asked, you know, Roger, hey, is it legit or is it snake oil kind of thing? And he used it in his system and he found it to be very effective. So I said, well, let me try that. All right? And the thing about it is it takes a little bit to kick in, but you notice the results, especially as it relates to how much you've got to clean the glass. So a, a simple example, in this particular case now, um, I've been using that Care Bacter now for, I think, think um, five-ish weeks, maybe four-ish weeks, something like that. So it, uh, in general, I think it's supposed to take six weeks or so to actually kind of kick into full bloom. Um, but in my particular case, um, for probably the last two or three weeks, I've noticed the fact that where I had to clean the glass every day, now I can clean the glass once every three, four days. Right, so it's kind of, you know, stunting, eating, whatever you want to call it, that, you know, uh, that growth of the, the algae that you have to clean off the glass. Um, which, again, to me is great because especially with this, with this bottom. And, and the way that you actually have to basically dose the stuff is dirt simple, meaning, number one, you can't overdose it, which I love. But number two, you know, when you kill the pumps to feed the fish, for example, what I do is basically you take a scoop, right, of this powder and you put it in and you do this once a week. That's it, right? Um, you know, for the first few weeks, you have to kind of hit it with like a mega dose, like you double up kind of thing. But regardless, it's it's one of those things where you don't have to test this and you don't have to actually go through and make a big production out of it. It's really simple to dose and it actually works. To me, it's one of those things where I know it just worked in my case. It's working in Roger's case, you know, and I can't necessarily, you know, measure it with a test kit to say it's because I have this quantity of this bacteria. It's just a product that you kind of got to trust. But either way, um, in this particular case, that's really helped with the bare bottom cleaning, right? The other thing that really kind of helped is, give me a second. So I created this nifty little tool. Basically, it's nothing more than a quarter inch of pipe, right, of the uh, CPVC. And what I did is you have glass cleaners that basically have a handle on, right, that you'll use to clean glasses, you know, and dishes and things of that nature. What I did is I basically chopped it off, super glued it, and now what I do is I put it in the tank and I can spin it around, right? And, and since it's kind of long, I can get back all along these crevices 
underneath here or underneath the rocks or in the back. And again, you can make this as long as you want, but it'll allow you to kind of get at those areas where we'll say a traditional magnet won't. And again, my goal really is to, to get it to the point where um, I'm only cleaning basically once a week. Um, and right now it looks like I'm gonna be able to do that with the help of those two products. Um, you know, as we look at the tank, right, some other lessons that are learned. So remember what I said is I banged this thing out within, you know, again, that very short window of time, and then I left to go out of town. And I said that was probably a bad choice, right? And the reason why that was is because after I got the, the tank all set up, right, and basically took the water from the, you know, um, the temporary tank, put it in this tank, filled it all up, you know, it was kind of like 3.30, 4 o'clock. I, um, I took and basically uh, plugged in the Neptune Apex to make sure that that all worked. And what I did is I used the heater and I plugged it into there because I was always afraid that the heater would stick open. And then and the Neptune Apex was basically a backup controller that would stop if that internal, you know, um, controller slash switch slash whatever you want to call it on the heater would break. Right. So I knew I wouldn't fry my fish. Well, the problem was, is when I plugged that thing in, um, I, I didn't plug it into the right socket. And as such, the heater didn't work on this tank. So while I was gone for that period of four days, five days, whatever it was, I had no heat in my tank. And when I, when I hooked the system up, basically given all the water and it hit the UPS, et cetera, I wasn't able to get my dial home features and all that sort of stuff working in the short amount of time. And I just figured, hey, I'd let it you know, run and use it from a controller perspective. Well, again, big mistake, right? Because I came back and the water temperature was cold. It was in the 60s kind of thing. Um, luckily, uh, it you know, luckily they're hardy fish and hardy, you know, coral and they, they survived. Um, but it just goes to show you again, you know, when you're doing something, you know, you, if you're leaving out of town at any point in time, try not to do anything to your tank, right? Because something will always fail. It just does, right? And in this particular case, if I had it to do again, though I was lucky with it, I should have waited, let the temporary tank do its thing, right? And then come back and slowly plan this tank out. Um, but again, as you get more mature in the hobby, you have a certain type of arrogance, right? That you think, oh, I got this, right? And in reality, there's something that you'll miss. And in my case, that's what it was. So that's another lesson where, you know, that dry run where I thought everything worked and everything checked out and, you know, whether it was lights being on to, um, um, to basically the heaters to the life support, it, I missed that. Um, another thing that I missed was basically one of these lights didn't follow the cycle, right? So meaning that in my end of it, um, I got the tank done, we'll say at 4, 4.30, uh, you know, I can't remember the exact details, but we left shortly after, like five or something like that. And the, again, the tank sitter, house sitter, they didn't, really didn't know any better. And what they didn't realize that this tank here, because of a uh, light, excuse me, this light here, because of a loose wire, basically never shut off, right? So it was taken and just slamming these corals 100% with light for four days. They didn't like that either, right? So surprisingly enough though, even though with you know, the light not shutting off from the cold water, the coral still survived. Right? Um, and with that said, you know, those are kind of the lessons of where I'm at to date. There's a lot of things I still have left to do. Um, one of them, for example, will be the back, right? I just still didn't put a back on. I didn't have time to paint the back. And I had some ideas of what I might do there, but you know, I still still have got to do that. I still have got to clean up some, you know, some wiring, and I've got to do some more work on the filtration just to make sure that again everything is kind of to the point where it can handle uh, more bio load if I want to add it, right? And it can handle the bio load that we have in here now. Because like I said, when I look at the tank, even though all my readings are good, right, um, it still comes back with the visual is not as deep and rich as before that tank crashed. 
corals are still growing, right? still have the colors, but like I say, it's not the same. You know, so to me, maybe a maturity thing, um, not exactly sure what it is, but in my particular case, there's a lesson in there somewhere. I have to figure out what it is. Um, but for the most part, I still go back to, I'm just happy that mostly everything survived. And at the end of this kind of, um, you know, we'll say uh, educational event, you know, the, the lessons that I took away from it, well, hopefully I can pass along here, then you can learn from it as well. And again, you won't, you won't have the same issues that I've had. Um, you know, from a tank perspective, um, you know, send me an email. Let me know if you've had anything like this happen to you. Um, I know one gentleman who we are going to work with with uh, another episode, he got hit with a nor'eastern, right? And he lost power. So we're going to kind of go through the lessons that he learned there. But again, uh, feel free to share and uh, in turn to send the email over to AmericanReef at me.com. And I'll be happy to kind of pass along that information. Or what we'll do is we'll kind of set up kind of a, an interview, sort of like what we do with Tim or Mike. And we'll kind of do it via long distance. And again, spread the word, so to speak, so others don't have to make the same mistakes that you make. Um, again, the, the major lessons here, you support those local small businesses, right? They have a heart and soul that will help you when you need the help, right? Um, three of my sponsors fall into that category, right? Whether it's Bulk Reef Supply, Premium Aquatics, or Tunzi, right? Again, I just can't say enough about them as people and as companies and their ability to basically make sure that they only sell quality products as well as making sure that they're there, you know, when you need them. Um, again, the local fish store in this particular case, it was Elmer's Aquariums. Right? Again, Monroeville, Pennsylvania, you heard, the, you heard how they helped me in this. If it wasn't for them, I would almost bet that I wouldn't be having a tank here today right, that, um, that he's at least looked this way with the same organisms, right. They happened to be there um, and did everything for me to help. Uh, also, again, on the actual products on here, um, try this Care Bacter out. Um, again, I think this box itself, you know, it was like 20, 30 bucks, something like that. Wasn't hugely expensive, um, but at the same time, all kind of value there as far as the, the time needing to clean the glass. It's doing just phenomenal. I would not, not have expected it at all to kind of work the way it has. Um, and lastly, if you need a, a little tool that, again, can get in the you know, corners that maybe you can't get to in the long tanks like this, um, again, all this is is PVC pipe with a bottle washer that's super glued into there, right? So that little wedge kind of does wonders. And, you know, with that being said, obviously we've seen the blades on the sticks that kind of do the same thing, you know, as far as kind of getting down into like the, the backs, etc. But to me, I always found that you can never get them long enough, right? And that's where this little kind of vehicle works good. And it's dirt cheap. Eight foot length, I believe it is like three bucks, right? Something like that. And you cut it with a pair of cutters. Um, and you can actually take and super glue a magnet or something onto there probably and kind of roll from there if you're really stuck on the magnet end of it. So with that said, again, those are the lessons that I learned with this tank. Stay tuned. Um, now it's my 125 gallon tank tank that I've got uh, space and room for other stuff. And uh, again, you'll see more episodes coming out in the future. Again, thanks for watching American Reef. And if you have your stores, be sure to send them over. Uh, American Reef at me.com.